just one second until YouTube loads. I think we will be good. Okay. We are all set. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. This is the last lecture of 2022. Uh, today's speakers are joining us from Rockefeller University, Theodora Hatziano and Paul Bienage. I will start by introducing Theodora first. Theodora is a research associate professor at Rockefeller University and is actively involved in teaching programs at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Theodora has worked on multiple viruses with a focus on retroviruses and the molecular mechanisms that govern virus tropism and on the improvement of animal models for human diseases. Theodora's research is guided by the premise that understanding the mechanisms by which lentivirus avoid or contract inhibitors in their natural host is fundamental to determining the prime at lentivirus host range. To successfully colonize a species, lentiviruses have to adapt to optimally use key host factors that are critical for virus replication. Equally importantly, viruses have to overcome host proteins known as restriction factors that inhibit virus replication in a species-specific manner. Hatziano has shown that although such restriction factors are generally beneficial as they protect humans from viruses infecting other primates, they may also account for our inability to generate optimal animal models for research on HIV and AIDS. Understanding how protein variation drives lentivirus adaptation provides important insights into the evolutionary history of lentiviruses and moreover suggests paths towards the development of novel animal models for HIV-1 to facilitate the evolution of clinical therapies, prevention strategies, and other interventions. This understanding of the interaction between primate lentiviruses and their hosts has allowed Theodora and her colleagues to manipulate HIV-1, becoming the first to develop an HIV-1-based virus that is able to cause AIDS-like disease in non-hominid. In parallel, these collaborat collaborative studies continually reveal novel aspects of the molecular biology of interactions between primate lentiviruses and their hosts. This is exemplified by the recent determination of the crystal structure of one such restriction factor. Another area of Hatsianus research focuses on identifying plasma samples from recovered COVID-19 patients that contain antibodies capable of neutralizing the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. She is one of the authors of the best virology textbook, in my opinion, called Principles of Virology, along with Vincent Recaniello, whom we had an honor to host last year. Dr. Bianash is head of the Laboratory of Retrovirology at the Rockefeller University and a Harvard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Paul seeks to define how host genes and pathways influence the replication of retroviruses, including HIV-1, focusing prim uh, primarily on human and primate immunodeficiency viruses, BNH and his team work to determine the functions of viral genes and proteins and characterize the host functions that retroviruses mimic and manipulate. They also study the molecular defense mechanisms that host cells have evolved against retrovirus infection from ancient to modern times. In addition, the team is working to develop more useful models of AIDS virus infection to provide improved testing of new forms of therapy and vaccination. For example, the lab recently found that mammalian cells can deplete viral RNA molecules that are recognized as foreign based on their nucleotide composition. They are also conducting a variety of investigations into the nature of innate and adaptive immunity to SARS-CoV-2 including the development of techniques required to identify protective antibodies and therapeutics. In addition to his work on modern viruses, BNH has pioneered the field of paleo, uh, paleovirology, which explores how ancient viruses impacted the evolution of their hosts. Mammalian genomes contain a fossil record of viral DNA from extinct retroviruses that infected the germ cells of ancient mammalian ancestors. And the BNH lab has recently has re, uh, recon reconstituted functional viruses and proteins encoded by this ancient viral DNA. The lab also seeks to understand how ancient retroviruses were extinguished, which may give clues about how to combat modern viral infection. And while preparing for this lecture, I found out that uh, Paul and Theodora are amazing. Uh, uh, they advocated for New York State to ban 
to close schools early on pandemic. And I really have to thank them for their service uh, with, you know, uh, science policy, decision making and, you know, so the floor is all yours. Uh, it is great to have you here. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much for having us. So um, one thing that perhaps I should mention is that we are also husband and wife. So if we are very appear very familiar with each other, it's uh, because we have uh, spent the last what twenty years at least together day <laughs> at work and at home. So our research overlaps a lot, and um, the projects feed into each other, which I hope is going to come through. So. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about this, uh, actually, the project that uh, that uh, was just described to you of our, about our work, about how uh, virus, cell proteins affect virus replication and how they influence virus tropism and how understanding this uh, interaction between the virus and the host can help us manipulate viruses and uh, expand their tropism. So I will give the first half of the lecture and then uh, Paul will give the second half. So let's start uh, just a, a grim reminder that um, HIV is uh, still a pandemic. I actually got asked that question by a journalist recently that asked me, is HIV one still a pandemic virus? And yes, it is. And it's actually the, uh, the, vir the, mo the single virus that causes the most, uh, the greatest number of deaths worldwide uh, at the moment, even compared with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is a very uh, plain um, uh, pic drawing of the retrovirus life cycle and HIV in uh, particular. So the virus uh, is integrated into our genetic uh, material and it uses a cellular machinery to transcribe its RNA. The RNA gets exported, makes GAG and GAG, which are the main structural proteins of the virus and makes more genomes. And the GAG pore will package the genome and assemble at the plasma membrane where it will start budding and it will incorporate the envelope glycoprotein onto the uh, nascent variant. After, shortly after release, the viral proteins will process the uh, structural proteins, so it will form this characteristic cone-shaped um, dense core of particle, and that particle is ready to initiate the next round of infection where we, we interact with the receptors, in the case of HIV-1 is CD4 and CCR5, most commonly enter at the plasma membrane, then get transported to the nucleus uh, while reverse transcription occurs, and then the uh, DNA will be integrated into the host genome by the viral uh, protein integrase. So while the virus is replicating in our, our after it enters our body or, and starts reproducing, our, the host obviously throw, tries to stop the virus at several different uh, stages. And the um, immune responses of humans are quite intricate and very interconnected. But for us to understand them better, we tend to try and separate them into uh, stages. So the first uh, line of responses involves intrinsic and innate immunity. So these are proteins that are already expressed in the cell that uh, can block uh, virus infection, in particular retroviruses, in a number of different stages during the uh, reproduction cycle. Or And also innate immunity, uh, production of interferon is the I think the best characterized response with that also induces the expression of even more proteins with antiviral pro properties. And then later on, you have the adaptive immunity kicking in the uh, in, uh, production of antibodies by B cells and, of course, uh, T cell responses. But this is the area that we are going to focus on. And these are the proteins that we, are, um, we have been interested uh, for the, the majority of our studies. Oh, we didn't get into B cells until SARS-CoV-2 came around. So uh, what are the intrinsic antiviral uh, defenses? So this is a, a series of proteins that can, as I mentioned, can act at different uh, steps of the virus reproduction um, 
cycle, whose main, if not only, function is to protect the cell from virus infection. And very often also we get the question asked, what, when we identify one of these proteins, what else does it do? And the argument for us is always, well, stopping viruses is a pretty important function. So even if it does just that, it's, uh, it's good enough. So the question, this field was really pioneered with HIV uh, many, many years ago, and now uh, an increasing number of these uh, restriction factors or cellular inhibitors are being discovered, and they act in a completely different uh, ways uh, to each other and can, as I mentioned, target multiple different uh, steps in uh, different ways. And of course, for a virus to successfully colonize a species, it has to overcome the res this restriction factors, these uh, intrinsic cellular inhibitors that are expressed in that uh, species. And this is um, what our work over the last uh, uh, decades, I would say, has focused on. So, uh, and with the final goal, of course, is if we understand all the, all these and know how the virus, uh, how they work and how the virus evades them, can we manipulate and use this knowledge to develop tools to study viruses even better? So HIV-1 is the uh, lentivirus that infects humans, but it's part of a much larger family. The majority of African primates actually have their own flavor of immunodeficiency virus called SIV for semen immunodeficiency viruses. And they're all, um, uh, I would say, distantly related. As each virus has colonized its species, it has become uh, specific to different degrees for that species. And generally, cross-species transmission between primate uh, lentiviruses are rare. Uh, and in the majority of the cases also, the virus has uh, achieved an equilibrium with its host, and it's uh, not really uh, pathogenic. Not always, but in the majority of the uh, African primate species. And there is a, the, the monkeys appear to live happily with quite high viral loads in uh, cases. The exceptions are the most recent transmissions that have led to the introduction of these viruses into humans, such as the virus that uh, infected chimpanzees that eventually passed into humans and led into the HIV-1 epidemic, and the a virus from Suchimangabis that has led to the uh, transmission of HIV-2, which is a bit less pathogenic in humans than HIV-1. So, as I mentioned, because this cross-species transmission is, is quite uh, rare and is uh, quite uh, difficult, once the virus adapts for a certain host, it then cannot, can no longer infect uh, monkeys or different hosts such as uh, monkeys. So for example, HIV-1 is pathogenic in humans, but it doesn't really reproduce or is pathogenic in any other uh, African uh, uh, monkey species. It can infect chimpanzees, but again, it's also not as pathogenic uh, as it is in humans. So that creates a problem because normally we want to study viruses in a relevant animal model. And such an animal model in, in this case is really monkeys because they mimic humans uh, better than mice in terms of the immune system. It's also um, uh, a better system for uh, various other reasons. So what I, the model that we have used for HIV-1 infections thus far has been infection of uh, a different uh, primate, so uh, Asian primates, macaques, that were actually accidentally, uh, originally accidentally infected with a virus that's most uh, closely related to HIV-2 and is uh, been uh, termed sav mac but this virus is genetically very distinct to HIV-1, and there are a number of limitations to those models and a number of questions that these models cannot answer. So uh, one of our original goals when we started uh, studying this close interaction between uh, viruses and hosts and their proteins was whether we could uh, eventually use this knowledge to develop a better animal model for AIDS. So, Let's just dive into these 
just move this out of the way, um, into this uh, restriction factor. So two of the main factors that were the first to be discovered uh, were the ApoBec3 proteins and the TRIM5 proteins. So ApoBec3 is a family of cytidine deaminases. It consists of several members, uh, some of uh, which have antiviral activity and some that do not. And uh, they, by um, a mechanism that's not fully understood for all members, managed to recognize the viral RNA in the cytoplasm and interact with it. And then as they interact with it, they get dragged into the nascent viral particles. But there they just, oops, sorry. They just, as a, um, for lack of a better term, hitch a ride until the virus enters the new target cell. And the apobec is within this core that is released in the cytoplasm. And as reverse transcription proceeds, you have the generation of this single-stranded DNA intermediate. And this is a target for the, uh, the apobec 3 deamination reaction. And it will change a C to a T that when this eventually this uh, strand is uh, transcribed will result in a net change of G to A and will cause multiple such mutations throughout the genome. We refer to this as a um, G to A hypermutation, that the genome is so heavily mutated that it's no longer um, uh, functional. It doesn't produce a virus anymore. So the Interaction of the ApoBec3 proteins with the viral RNA makes it extremely difficult for the virus to evade it by changing its RNA. It would have to really change it in a lot of different places. So instead of trying to manipulate uh, the RNA, what HIV and other lentiviruses have done is use a small accessory protein. Uh, they're so cool because originally their function was not known and simple retroviruses don't have these proteins. So, but what appears to happen is that these uh, proteins uh, tend to target uh, restriction factors, cellular inhibitors that inhibit uh, virus uh, reproduction. And in this particular case, this pro uh, protein uh, called FIF or viral infectivity factor interacts with ApoBec3 proteins and then recruits a uh, CAL5 uh, ubiquitin ligase uh, complex that targets ApoBec3 proteins for degradation. So what it essentially does, it reduces the concentration of ApoBec3 in the cytoplasm of the producer cell. So you don't have enough protein that can go get incorporated into the uh, particle. And VIF is where species specificity is introduced. So the HIV-1 VIF protein can target human ApoBec3 for uh, degradation, but cannot target ApoBec3 from other species such as macaques. And another protein that acts at a different uh, stage of the virus uh, reproduction cycle is TRIM5. And TRIM5 acts by a completely different uh, way. It recognizes the capsid of the incoming uh, viral uh, core and blocks subsequent steps of, um, of the uh, replication. And again, here, TRIM5 itself has a, a specificity for the capsid. And the way that the virus has uh, evolved to counteract TRIM5 is by changing the capsid protein. So HIV capsid is uh, basically uh, selected for the, uh, not to be seen by the human TRIM5. So this is the uh, how the TRIM5 uh, monomer looks like. It dimerizes and then can form larger uh, order multimers that essentially envelope the uh, HIV-1 core capsid lattice that enters the uh, cytoplasm of the cell and blocks subsequent steps of the virus uh, replication. And here's a, a species specificity that I was uh, referring to. So human TRIM5 alpha is actually not very good at recognizing any of the primate lentiviruses or the majority of them that we have tested. And then as you go into rhesus trim 5 alpha on the other hand, is very good at recognizing HIV and uh, SIV uh, uh, CPZ uh, capsids, but obviously SIV MAC capsid has a, uh, adapted so that it's no longer seen by rhesus trim 5 alpha. And what we discovered early during our exploration of trim 5 alpha flavors amongst uh, primates is that in pigtail uh, macaques, which um, is a, a relative of uh, rhesus macaques and are also used in uh, research, we have a very unusual event that has happened at the trim 5 alpha locus. So if this is the exons that will lead to the expression of trim 5 uh, alpha, what has happened in pigtail macaques is the exon 8 is skipped 
and the exon 8 codes for the spry domain, which is a domain of trim 5 alpha that will recognize capsid. And the net result is to replace this exon by a cyclophilin A uh, like sequence. So, cyclophilin A is a protein that interacts with uh, lentiviral capsids uh, and has been characterized to do so for many years. But what was even more fortuitous in this case was that this CIP A in the trim 5 locus in pigtail macaques had acquired two mutations that rendered it incapable of seeing the HIV-1 capsid. So as far as we were uh, concerned for our purposes, pigtail macaques were trim 5 uh, null. Their uh, trim 5 did not uh, see HIV-1 uh, capsid. So what that allowed us to do is to focus on just one family of restriction factors, the APOBEC3 proteins. And uh, knowing that the VIF is the uh, viral protein that is responsible for counteracting apobec 3 proteins, all we had to do to generate potentially a virus that would be uh, capable of replicating in uh, pigtail macaques was to replace the VIF sequence uh, in HIV with a VIF sequence from a virus that we knew could counteract macaque apobec 3 proteins. And in this case, it's the VIF protein from uh, apobec 3 from, sorry, from um, SIV Mac. So this is a minimally modified virus. It has uh, this, uh, VIF constitutes approximately 6% of the uh, genome. And when we tested this virus in uh, primary cells, so the, the cells that would be the target of virus replication in the animal, you see that in the pigtail macaques, you have the, a virus that's adapted in these uh, animals can replicate very well. Uh, in cell culture in the cells from these animals. In contrast, HIV can replicate a, a little bit because presumably there is no trim 5 to stop it, but replication is quickly controlled and, the, uh, and this is most likely due to apobec 3 proteins. In contrast, a minimally modified HIV, S, of which we call simiantropic HIV, can now replicate to uh, levels up, approximating those we see for this um, SIV strain. So what happens when we take this virus and we introduce it into animals? And this is what we did here. So in this graph, what you see is the plasma viremia, so the amount of virus in the plasma of the animals. The animals were injected intravenously with our STHIV uh, produced in cell culture. And you can see that the acute viremia levels are actually were quite, I would say, quite impressive for a first uh, go. But virus replication was quickly co uh, controlled. In the, and the hallmark of HIV replication is the depletion of CD4 uh, T cells. And you can see that at least in this animal in red, you have this uh, dip and in the uh, less so in the black one, uh, transient dip as expected and the, the viral, uh, the CD4 uh, T cells uh, come back. Now, what we tried, what we knew uh, we could do, and it's a trick you can uh, do when you're using animal models, is to remove another arm of the immune system, the CD8 cell. So we know that CD8 T cells uh, is it play a, a role in controlling uh, viremia, and we wanted to determine whether this, what role these CD8 T cells played in this animal model uh, in controlling uh, virus uh, replication. So we can inject the animals with an anti-CD8 uh, antibody that will transiently deplete uh, CD8 cells from the periphery. So you can see here it works very well. And then the uh, CD8 cells come um, back. And what you see is that the viral loads uh, immediately uh, increase. So we only did this in the black, in the animal with a black line. And then as soon as the CD8 cells come back, the uh, viral loads decline again. But this transient increase in viremia allowed us to take blood from this animal and, in, and passage it to a new animal. And this is a trick that um, you can do if you want to adapt the virus to this new host. It's sequentially passage uh, the virus just as you would do in tissue culture, but instead of cells, you're using whole animals and try to encourage the virus to acquire the uh, uh, mutations that will allow it to replicate better. So this is what happened in uh, passage two. We took, as I said, we took a blood from this animal, transferred it to another animal. And again, at, at this stage, we started deploying this CD8 uh, uh, cell depletion 
at the time of inoculation. So that uh, results in a, a, a boost of the acute uh, virus titus. And then you can uh, actually administer this uh, again uh, and see again a transient boost of uh, viremia later on. And this is the CD4 T cells in this uh, passage two animal. And then at the, after the second CD8 uh, 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 depletion, we actually also took uh, a blood again from this animal and did another passage and so uh, on and so forth until we reached uh, passage four. And uh, passage four is where we started uh, observing um, uh, more interesting um, um, phenotypes in that way. So in all passage four animals, we had a very uh, dramatic depletion of CD4 T cells in all uh, uh, the three uh, animals uh, within uh, four weeks post inoculation. In two of these animals, the CD4 uh, cells slowly started coming back, but in one of them, they didn't. And this particular animal eventually had to be euthanized uh, uh, because it was uh, very sick. So this is what the viral loads looked in all these animals. So you see you have the uh, quite uh, nice acute viremia levels, very high in all three animals. In two of them, they started uh, declining over time. But in, the, uh, in this one, uh, C, they never declined. In fact, they continue uh, uh, go increasing until the animal had to be euthanized. And uh, again, this is the CD4 uh, T cells uh, in the periphery, as I uh, that represent what I showed you earlier, um, or rather uh, correlate with what I showed you uh, earlier. So you have the uh, initial dip in CD4 uh, T cells, and then in these two animals, they stabilize. In the uh, third animal, they never recover. So what did this animal, um, why, did, why was this animal so sick? So the symptoms that the animal displayed were uh, what I would say are textbook HIV-like symptoms that very early, uh, that you would see in patients very early prior to the availability of treatment that we have uh, nowadays. So for example, in the lungs, there was a detection of uh, organisms probably uh, corresponding to some uh, species of pneumocysti. So these are bacteria that uh, infiltrate the uh, host and that normally the immune system would be able to uh, fend off. But in this case, because it's severely compromised, it cannot, it doesn't, the CD4 uh, T cells are not there. And also tumors that are due to, again, infection by uh, other viruses in this uh, particular uh, case in the kidney. And these tumors are, are actually uh, a B cell lymphoma, which again, uh, are rather uh, common in um, AIDS. So the animal essentially uh, succumbed to AIDS. And uh, this is the first time that uh, an HIV-like virus was capable of inducing AIDS in uh, anything other than um, humans. So we wanted to make sure that this was not, there was nothing uh, weird about this animal that we could reproduce this uh, finding. So we took blood from the animal um, and used it to inoculate four new animals. At this stage, we tried uh, two different approaches at the time of inoculation of passage five. So two animals uh, here, A and B, were not uh, CD8 depleted and two animal C and D were CD8 depleted at the time of inoculation. And what I hope you can appreciate here, you have two uh, quite different trajectories of uh, infection. In the non-depleted animal, the red and the black, what you see is again a very uh, a good acute viremia, but virus replication is uh, controlled uh, very, very quickly. In the depleted animals, in contrast, you see these very, very high levels of uh, virus replication that uh, essentially does not, uh, uh, is not reduced and remains very, very high until the animals succumb to disease. And uh, both of these had AIDS um, uh, symptoms. And in fact, progression in both of those animals was rather rapid. So what we try to do in the two non-depleted uh, animals is to see what happens if we deplete the CD8 cells later, not at the time of inoculation. And there you get this transient boost of uh, viremia, as we had seen before, but it's, it 
is controlled uh, uh, within a, uh, a, a few um, days. It doesn't recapitulate what we see when we deplete the CD8 cells at the time of nucleation. So what this data shows is that we the CD8s at the time of virus inoculation play a very important role to the eventual outcome of disease. And um, that we can, in our model now, we can manipulate uh, whether the animals become rapid progressors or elite controllers just by uh, having CD8s there or not at the time of inoculation. And again, this is to show that we can uh, reproduce this by taking uh, blood from an animal in passage five and passaging it uh, one uh, more, initiating passage six. Again, you always see the same thing. Uh, it's very reproducible. If you deplete CD8 cells at the time of nucleation, you progress to AIDS. If you don't, the virinia is controlled. So this was, um, it was good. It was very good that we were able to reproduce this. But ultimately, if you want to be able to use this virus as a, a, in an animal model, you need to be uh, to have a very well characterized stock and not rely on blood from an animal, which a is limited and b might lead to uh, inconsistent results in, uh, in new animals. So what we did is we sequenced viruses from the first animal to succumb to uh, AIDS and uh, reconstructed multiple molecular clones, characterized them in cell culture, and finally selected uh, what we thought was the best to test uh, in animals. So this is a, a molecular clone of uh, this minimally modified HIV, SDHIV, which is uh, named GM87. And we use that uh, supernatant produced now in cells in culture to inoculate uh, two animals. So in this first two animals where we did not deplete, you see again uh, exactly the same uh, phenotype that we saw when we transferred blood from uh, this animal. The virus, uh, viremia, viremia, acute viremia is very high, but virus replication is controlled. In contrast, if we inoculate animals that are CD8 depleted at the time of inoculation, viremia is very high and is sustained at uh, relatively high levels until the, both animals succumb to AIDS uh, uh, disease. And CD4 T cells in these animals were uh, rapidly depleted. So now we have a tool, we really have a, a molecular clone that we can produce at will in the lab and have it pre uh, consistently uh, produce eye, a disease if we CD8 deplete the animals or uh, infection, but control uh, viremia if we don't deplete the animals. And why is this important? What what was the ultimate goal um, of of, of this whole uh, project. So the goal was, as I mentioned before, to have a good, a better animal model for um, uh, interventions on potentially vaccine development against HIV. So this is uh, a study that uh, we actually has actually just been submitted uh, for publication, and I would say it consists of validation of our model. So uh, there is a new um, and antiretroviral drugs being developed all the time, and with the goal of uh, them is to apply them in PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis. In the US, is one of the biggest uh, government initiatives at the moment to reduce the number of new infections. And the goal is to A, find uh, more drugs that uh, there's no resistance for or can be used together with other drugs to avoid the generation of resistance, but also long uh, acting drugs that are injectable and that the patient can uh, go to the doctor, get them injected. And then you know that the patient has this uh, level of drug in their body for a, a, a a fixed amount of time. And one such drug is Lena Kapavir, it's developed um, by uh, geez? Gilead. Gilead. Uh, and it acts, uh, it targets the HIV-1 capsid. So it's a completely novel uh, mechanism of inhibition, uh, different to all the previous existing drugs. And it targets multiple different um, uh, steps of the viral uh, cycle. So the, if you remember the capsid is important for driving assembly, but it's also important for uh, getting the uh, core to the nucleus and, and coating and allowing uh, it, 
uh, entry to uh, proceed to integration. So this uh, drug binds into the uh, uh, capsid uh, monomer in interface and uh, blocks, as I mentioned, multiple steps of virus replication, sorry. And what is important is that it actually, due to the differences between SIV capsid and HIV-1 capsid, this drug is, while it's very effective against HIV-1, is not as effective against SIV-MAC. So that is one of the examples where the ex pre-existing models had limitations in terms of testing uh, drug uh, efficacy. But uh, our model didn't because it has the authentic HIV-1 capsid. So what we did with our collaboration, collaborators and collaboration with uh, Gilead was to test this uh, drug as a, a potential uh, agent for pre-exposure prophylaxis in peak tail macaques. So the first thing they uh, did is to look at the PK, so how well the uh, drug is, uh, levels are maintained uh, following injection in uh, peak tail macaques. And uh, these uh, um, uh, look great. The, the, uh, and the drug is safe and the animals uh, are maintained at quite high levels for a, a really uh, long uh, time. And now the key experiment is what happens if, does it protect the animals from uh, infection? So in this uh, case, we did not need the animals to progress to disease. So this STHIV challenge happened without CDA depletion, because the, if you remember, the acute viremia levels are very high even when we don't deplete. So in control animals, if you, uh, if you just uh, in, inject them with, with a vehicle and then you challenge them with STHIV, you see the acute viremia reaching about 10 to the 6, which is what we expect. Now, if you treat, pre-treat the animals with the standard uh, antiretroviral cocktail, so three different drugs, and then challenge them with STHIV, you don't see any viremia. So the animals are protected. And Importantly, the same thing happens if instead of this three drug cocktail, you now inject this anim the animals with the um, long acting lenacapavir prior to challenge. So you inject the animals and then challenge them with STHIV and you see that none of the animals uh, actually uh, develop viremia. And we followed these animals out to really, really a uh, long time and looked very, very hard to try and see if there was any uh, virus anywhere at all, and uh, we didn't identify, we couldn't identify anyone. So this is a proof of principle study suggesting that showing that lenacapavir is an agent, uh, a drug that's suitable to be used for pre-exposure prophylaxis in humans. So this concludes uh, my part of the talk. So what I've shown you is that how uh, understanding the very basic interactions between cellular host factors and the virus has led us to uh, produce an adapted HIV-1 that can cause AIDS in pig tail macaques. And uh, for the first time, recapitulate uh, uh, AIDS in a non-human uh, primate. And that we can manipulate the outcome of the disease uh, with uh, by uh, manipulating the conditions early in infection and how we can use this model to evaluate new uh, therapeutics and vaccines. So in the next uh, part, as I told you, we were trying to characterize um, the virus that, uh, what happened to the virus following adaptation in the macaques. And we documented a lot of changes, particularly in the envelope, which was not surprising. It's the major antigen target. But a change that surprised us in the beginning was that uh, one of other small accessory protein of, a, of our STHIV had acquired some mutations in its uh, transmembrane domain. And this little protein was VPU. And that led us to the uh, other project that Paul is going to talk to you about. Okay, thank you, Theodora. So, so let, let me preface what I'm going, going to say by, um, as Theodora told you at the beginning of that um, simiotropic HIV project, we made some engineering and, and selection steps in order to make the virus um, as amenable to replication in macaques as possible. Um, but at the outset of the project. We obviously didn't know everything about the biology of the virus. We didn't know the function of at least some of the accessory proteins. And so in some respects, it, it's a blind experiment. You, you start with a virus that can replicate to some degree in the macaques, 
but you're hoping for some uh, evolution, some adaptation. And the story that I'm going to tell you now involves actually studying that evolution and adaptation and how it helped us uh, really understand the function of one of the uh, HIV accessory proteins. <clears throat> so that protein is called uh, VPU. It's a small HIV protein, has a transmembrane domain, cytoplasmic tail, um, something of a scientific backwater in HIV research, because in many instances, you can delete this gene from the HIV genome and the virus replicates uh, just fine. Um, but there are some cell types in which that's not true. And in fact, you can divide cell types into, I'm giving them two colors, red and green here, but we call them permissive and non-permissive. <clears throat> that is in terms of their ability to support the replication of an HIV-1 from which the, this accessory gene, the uh, VPU gene, has been uh, deleted. So as I mentioned, many cell types have this sort of green phenotype where you can put a wild type or a VPU deleted HIV strain onto those cells, put a small amount of virus on and get a large amount of virus out. That's normal virus replication. A small number of cells that we'll call non-permissive, um, while they'll support replication of a wild type HIV strain very nicely, what happens when you infect them with a VP de VPU deleted virus, the cells get infected, they make virus particles, but those virus particles have a great deal of difficulty in leaving the cell. So <clears throat> the presence of VPU really allows the virus to leave particular types of cell. Uh, this is basically everything we knew about VPU at the start of the project that Theodora told you about. But what happened in the intervening years while we were doing this uh, adaptation experiment in macaques is we learned really quite a lot about what VPU does uh, and how it works. And that's, that's what I'll tell you in the next few minutes. So the first thing we learned was that you could convert a green cell into a red cell, uh, permissive to a non-permissive cell in terms of VPU deleted HIV replication by treating them with type one interferon. So type one interferons are a message that cells make when they sense that viruses are about, send a message to other cells to induce a gene expression program that, that typically inhibits a wide range of viruses. And what we found is that just simply treating many cells with type one interferon induced a requirement for VPU during HIV-1 replication. <clears throat> so based on that, we looked for genes that were not expressed in cells with the green phenotype, that were expressed in cells with the red phenotype, but could be turned on in the green cells by type one interferon. And because we knew something about where the, the replication defect was occurring during particle release, uh, we looked for genes that um, either made cell surface proteins or secreted proteins. That led us to one particular gene, that gene we've called tetherin for reasons that will become obvious if they're not already. And what we were able to show is if we took this one single gene and expressed it in a cell line that normally has that sort of green phenotype, that is it could support the replication of a wild type or VPU deleted virus, uh, as measured here by how much virus you get out of those infected cells. It's the same with the wild type or VPU deleted virus. But if you just add that single gene, you impose the requirement uh, for VPU. So 293 T cells expressing this one gene um, <clears throat> now you need VPU. Another cell, same phenotype, um, but now we're, we're looking at this slightly differently. So we have this cell line, HT1080, I, without or with this tethering gene. If you have a wild type virus or a VPU deleted virus, infect those cells, look at the surface of those cells, you'll see a few virus particles. If you take those same cells, express this tethering gene, Wild-type virus, you see a few more virus particles on the surface of those cells, 
but a VP, uh, an HIV strain that lacks the VPU, what you see is this massive accumulation of virus particles. The infected cells making many viruses, but they're just not able to leave the surface of the cell. Tetherin is really trapping virus on the surface of the cells, it's in sometimes in these clouds, sometimes in these chains. So what is tetherin? How does it work? Well, this is the protein that's encoded by the tetherin gene. Very unusual protein. Uh, unusual in that it has both a transmembrane domain at its amino terminus and then a glycophosphatidylinositol anchor at its carboxy terminus. That is a nearly unique configuration in nature. And essentially separating those transmembrane domains is a coiled coil, a dimeric coiled coil, which essentially means the protein is a rod with two transmembrane anchors at either end. Uh, what we were able to find, in fact, that tetherin is a very ancient protein. It's present in essentially all vertebrates. You can go all the way back to sharks and find uh, proteins that look like tetherin. When I say look like tetherin, that is they have this same general configuration. But over the hundreds of millions of years that tetherin has been in existence, sequence homology has been essentially erased from uh, divergent members of this single uh, gene family. If, even if you just look within mammals or go a little further afield uh, to reptiles, here's a, a sequence alignment and you can see the level of uh, sequence identity is really rather low. Uh, for, for a protein um, with any type of function. Um, now, unlike the human tether, well, like the human tethering protein, the proteins from divergent mammals, from reptiles, from fish, from bony fish like sharks, um, all of these proteins have antiviral activity. That is, if you express increasing amounts of that protein, they will decrease the amount of virus that's generated from cells expressing that protein. But the HIV-1 VPU protein clearly acts to counteract the effect of this uh, tetherin protein. So if you have a v HIV without VPU, more tetherin, less virus, that's just not true with a wild type HIV-1. Clearly VPU is acting as an antagonist of the tetherin protein works against the human protein, doesn't work against these uh, more divergent proteins. The other thing about tetherin is that it works against a whole range of different viruses. In fact, it works against viruses whose viral proteins have zero, zero sequence or structural homology, okay? So this is an experiment with Ebola virus we can make Ebola virus-like particles just by expressing this single Ebola virus protein. This is what's expressed in the cells, and this is what's released as virus-like particles into the supernatant. And what you find is without tetherin, you get particles. If you add tetherin, no particles are released. But that, again, can be counteracted by the HIV-1 VPU protein. Of course, Ebola virus knows nothing about HIV-1 VPU. It has, it's nothing like HIV in its, in its biology, but it is similar in the sense that it can be trapped by um, tetherin proteins. Now, the, the profound lack of sequence homology between tetherin proteins that have basically the same antiviral function prompted us to try an experiment that has a pretty uh, remarkable design and result. And that is this. So we took the uh, tetherin protein from humans and essentially rebuilt it using protein domains from um, completely different proteins. So they were they had essentially zero sequence homology. The only way that they were similar to tetherin was in the, the configuration of the protein domains. So, for example, if we take the amino terminus of the transferrin receptor, it's a dimeric protein, two transmembrane domains, N terminus in the cytoplasm. We take uh, coil coils from a completely dis different protein, dystrophia myotonica protein kinase. 
link that to the transferrin transmembrane domains, and then put on the C terminus uh, a little bit of this protein urocleinase plasminogen activator receptor. No homology to tether in. The only thing that's similar is it puts a GPI anchor. And we make this completely artificial protein. We call it artificial tetherin. But amazingly enough, it can do the same thing as tetherin. So these are cells that have been that are making HIV particles. They don't have tetherin. They have the regular wild type tetherin, and they have this, uh, in this case, the artificial tetherin. And you can see in both cases, uh, the particles get trapped on the surface almost as efficiently by this fake artificial tetherin as with the, the wild type protein. That tells us something, I think, quite important. It's that what it says is that it's very unlikely that tether is, is doing something complicated or sophisticated, like sensing or signaling, telling the cells to activate a program that uh, tracks virus particles on the surface. Very much more likely is the proteins acting in a very simple and direct way to actually trap virus on the surface. And, and you can come up with all sorts of models as to how that might be so. We have basically with a rod shape and two membrane anchors, you could imagine that perhaps uh, one membrane anchor might get um, trapped in uh, the, the membrane of the virus versus the cell, infiltrating the lipid membrane as virus particles bud and causing the particles to trap. Or you could invoke some kind of um, homomultimerization scheme where uh, simply having this protein around tethers virus uh, to the cells via self-association. But we took advantage of the extreme flexibility in sequence that tethering exhibits to do, do an experiment that really sort of nails it in terms of precisely what tethering is doing. So we designed tethering proteins um, with epitope tags, various places in the protein, uh, or protease cleavage sites at other places in the protein, we could sort of mix and match, move these things around. And what this enabled us to do is in a programmable way, cut the tethering protein while it's in the act of trapping viruses at the cell surface. And you can see the results of such an experiment on the right here. So on the top panel, we have cells that have been infected for various times. And then at these various times, we treat the cells with this protease factor 10A that we programmed the site for it into the tethering protein. And you can see, let's look at just at this 48 hour time point. If we add factor 10A and look at whether we get released virus particles, we can absolutely uh, release virus particles just by cutting the tethering uh, protein at this point. And then by using epitope tags placed here and here, um, and then measuring the amount of epitope tags that are present in the virus particles that are released from those um, uh, infected cells, we can find that in fact, um, the configuration that you see here with the virus particle here with the GPI anchor, um, tetherin's GPI anchor inserted into it, and the N-terminus of tetherin trapped in the cell, that is in fact what happens most of the time. About three quarters of the tetherin molecules that are involved in entrapment are in this configuration with the, uh, the, uh, the C-terminus associated with the virus particle and the amino terminus associated with the cell. About a quarter of the molecules are in the opposite orientation. But that nevertheless, I think, demonstrates pretty clearly that the tethering protein is directly interacting with virus particles, causing them to become entrapped. And then we can essentially cut them off um, with, um, with this um, protease. So um, in experiments that I won't show you, we could show biochemically that the HIV-1 VPU accessory protein actually biochemically interacts with tetherin. We can use cross-linking to show that their transmembrane domains interact. But perhaps a little more elegantly, you can do a genetic experiment 
where you take a human tethering protein and replace its transmembrane domain with the, ex with the same protein sequence from a monkey. In this case, we've used an African green monkey, but it works with macaques um, and whatever. What you will find is that among primates, there's an unusual diversity in amino acid sequence among the transmembrane domains. Um, but what you'll see, what you find functionally is with the human tethering, more tethering, less virus particle release, but that's counteracted by HIV-1 VPU. But you change that transmembrane domain, you have a tethering protein that's just as potent, but is completely resistant to antagonism uh, by the HIV-1 uh, VPU protein. So that, that HIV-1 VPU protein has specifically adapted to target the transmembrane domain of human tethering and doesn't do well at all. In fact, doesn't is completely inactive against tetherins with those monkey transmembrane domains. And so this brings us full circle to the uh, experiment that Theodora told you about during this adaptation process where HIV-1 was adapting to replicate um, in macaques. Uh, what happened was that the HIV-1 VPU gained a function, and it gained a function by mutating its transmembrane domain. So here's the sequence of the VPU transmembrane domain that we started with, and after passage in macaques, it had changed. Functionally, what that means is that if you use pigtail macaque tethering, no VPU, more tethering, less virus, okay? If you use the wild-type VPU, well, the VP we started with does not work out at all against pigtail macaque tethering. But this adapted VPU protein that acquired these mutations during evolution in macaque essentially gained the ability to antagonize uh, the pigtail macaque uh, protein. So this, this um, process of adaptation, uh, transferring from one species to another, um, clearly uh, imposed a selective pressure on the VPU protein to gain the ability to antagonize the, um, the macaque VPU, uh, the uh, macaque tethering protein. Now, um, just to summarize what I've said then is that tethering is an ancient antiviral protein that traps HIV particles, as well as many other envelope particles on, on the surface of a cell using a direct tethering mechanism. Uh, because it's targeting the lipid envelope of the virus particle, it targets an indispensable host component of the virion. No specific interaction with viral proteins is required, and that um, uh, reduces the opportunity for the virus to evolve resistance. And this is really why we think that vi viruses have acquired things like accessory genes. The these are new activities that essentially go after virus host defense mechanisms um, um, to antagonize them and stop them from functioning. And as I've shown, that is, that is a potential uh, barrier to uh, cross uh, species um, transmission. So I note now that we are at two o'clock. I do have about 10 more minutes of material. Um, should, we, should we go on or should we stop here for questions? I think we're good to go if that's okay with you. You mean stop here or continue? No, no, continue, continue if that's okay with you. Okay, certainly, yeah. certainly. So, so just for the last few minutes, what I'd like to tell you about is, is a completely different uh, uh, antiviral uh, mechanism. Um, we, we found this, again, using HIV, but it turns out to be generally uh, quite important, but also has a, a practical application. Now, in order to tell you about that, I need to tell you about a, a phenomenon, a phenomenon, a property of our genomes. And that is that our genomes have um, a lower than expected number of CPG dinucleotides. That's a C followed by a G. We know very well why that's the case. Um, there are methyl transferases that methylate cytosines that are in a CPG dinucleotide. That causes them to become 5-methyl cytosines. Then if they're deaminated, okay, and this cause uh, happens at a spontaneous uh, low but non-zero event, that deamination leads to thymine, okay? 
if without that methylation, that deamination would lead to uracil, which would be recognized by repair machinery and excised. But because it's a C to T change, repair machinery gets a little confused as to which is the correct nucleotide and which is the new mutation, and sometimes makes a mistake. So instead of that CG being repaired, that it thinks the TG is the right one and repairs the repairs the opposite strand. And so you get a, a net TG to uh, AC di dinucleotide pair in, in the uh, genome. So this, as I say, happens rarely, but it's been happening for hundreds of millions of years. As, as long as these um, methyl transferases that target CG dinucleotides have, have been in existence. And what that means is that certain types of organisms, us included, have way, way lower levels of CPG in our genomes than expected. So these are the sort of the frequency distributions of the all 16 possible dinucleotides. And they're all there at roughly the expected frequency with one notable exception, which is CPG, uh, which particularly in vertebrates, core data, has very much lower levels than, than are expected. Other phylums such as arthropods and insects, they have expected levels of CPG because they just don't have these methyl transferases that would enable the depletion of the CPGs by the mechanisms that I have told you about. So remarkable um, depletion of CPGs via DNA-based mechanisms uh, uh, depletion of those CPGs from the genomes of modern organisms. Now, what's interesting and even more amazing is that the viruses of um, these various hosts tend to mimic this CPG suppressed state of this host. And that's particularly evident in vertebrates. So here are the number of CG dinucleotides um, observed divided by the expected based on mononucleotide composition for RNA viruses that inhabit these, these sets of hosts. Now, I emphasize the fact that these are RNA viruses because RNA doesn't have access to that mechanism that I just told you about. Okay, there are no mechanisms for RNA. Uh, um, uh, methylation and deamination that would lead to the the effects that I've seen that I've just told you about. So this is clearly viruses trying to mimic the CPG suppressed or depleted states of their hosts. Now, why would they do that? Okay, so to cut a quite a long story very short, it turns out that CPG dinucleotides are lethal in RNA viruses if you put them uh, uh, into the genomes of those viruses at too high a frequency. So as I said, vertebrate viruses mimic the C CPG poor state of their hosts. That is absolutely true of HIV-1. If you look at the nucleotide composition of HIV-1, it has a lot of A's. Um, it has very few Cs, in fact, and it's particularly depleted in CPG dinucleotides. So this, this, this uh, slide shows the results of an experiment where we took an HIV genome, took a little piece of that HIV genome, and put, put back some CPG dinucleotides. We did that by um, synonymous or silent mutagenesis, just changing wobble positions in codons. So we don't change protein coding sequence. Uh, we just change uh, the nucleotide sequence, keep the protein coding sequence the same. If you then ask the virus to replicate in normal cells, um, this is a wild type replication. We're measuring how many cells are infected, but we're using a reporter protein GFP. But if you just add CPGs to this segment of the viral genome, and you don't have to do a, make a lot, um, the number of CPGs here is they're present at the frequency that you would find in random nucleotide se sequence of uniform base composition, that is lethal to the virus. It causes the virus to be dead, okay? 
Now, doing a, a sort of focused genetic screen, what we found is that the host protein that's responsible for imposing this replication defect turns out to be another class of antiviral mechanisms. And in fact, this protein is what's responsible. Zinc finger antiviral protein, ZAP, inhibits the replication of viruses with too many CPG dinucleotides in their genome. So if you do exactly the same experiment, but we do this with a cell line where we have knocked out um, ZAP, this zinc finger antiviral protein, then that virus with extra CPGs in this segment replicates just fine. So we've come to learn quite a bit about ZAP. This is what the ZAP protein looks like. It's rather a long protein, but the business end is all at one end. It's an RNA binding protein and it has this basic groove um, and it directly recognizes CPG dinucleotides, binds to those, um, those dinucleotides. It has two pockets that can only accommodate a C and a G uh, dinucleotide. And it has a bunch of cofactors that together um, form complexes that includes a nuclease that essentially what happens is that ZAP multimerizes, targets multiple CGs in the uh, genome of RNA viruses, recruits that nuclease and digests um, the virus. So it's really a mechanism for recognizing viral genomes that have too many CGs in them and then removing them from the cell. So we've learned quite a bit about this mechanism, what the numbers of CG nucleotides, what the space, the ideal spacing is for making viral genomes ZAP sensitive. And that's allowed us to design viral genomes that are sensitive to ZAP. And this is what we've done here um, in the context of a picornavirus. It's a picornavirus EV71. It causes hand, foot, and mouth disease. It's a scourge of daycare centers around the world, makes kids very sick, sometimes gives them very serious illnesses. Um, but what we, what we can do here is if we make um, manipulate the nucleotide composition of the genome so it's largely single-stranded, and has a slightly elevated number of CG dinucleotides, we can make a viral genome that is exquisitely sensitive uh, to ZAP, okay? So the virus replicates very nicely in the absence of ZAP, very poorly in the presence of ZAP. Um, we can show that's true not just in cell culture, but also in mice. So we've made a mouse line that doesn't have ZAP, the wild type, uh, virus replicates equivalently in the mice that do and don't have ZAP, causes them to be paralyzed and get sick. But if we make a virus that is very ZAP sensitive, um, it kills the mice that don't have ZAP, um, um, gives them paralysis, um, but replicates very poorly in normal wild type mice. Okay, so this virus that is ZAP sensitive um, we can actually use as a vaccine. So what we've done here is to take this ZAP-sensitive attenuated EV71. We've infected um, mice with it when they're, they're very young. The, this with infection with the wild-type virus would normally paralyze and kill these mice. But with their attenuated virus, they do very well. They make high titers of neutralizing antibodies to, to that virus. And those mice can grow up, grow up become mothers, uh, mate with uh, regular females, and then they have offspring to which they can transfer immunity. And if we take the offspring of this mating and then infect them with the, uh, the wild type virulent strain, um, then if their mothers have been immunized, then those mice do very well. If their mothers have not been immunized, then those mice succumb and are paralyzed and killed by the virulent wild type virus. So what this means in fact is that this is uh, one of the first, I think really rationally designed attenuated by, by manipulating genome composition virus that, that has this attenuated phenotype that could be used um, as a vaccine. So um, let's wrap up, summarize everything we've told you. I uh, hope we've convinced you that knowledge of these antiviral proteins can be usefully applied. 
Uh, first, it allows us to understand how vi virus host range is limited, enables the generation of new animal models, which Theodora told you about, that can be used for evaluating new medicines. And as I just mentioned, enables the generation of novel uh, attenuated um, viral vaccines. Um, so uh, I think we can stop there and uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Paul and Theodora. I have a couple of questions in chat, but if someone wants to speak up or write them directly, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. So the first question is, what is the future of your research? Uh, I, I have to say that while I prepared the introduction, I didn't expect to get this talk uh, <laughs> because it's getting more towards, at least in my opinion, more towards like structural biology, biochemi biochemistry, like fundamental part. And I'm not sure what's going to happen afterwards. So we, your... do, we do that too. So the, um, so I think that what, what our research shows is if somebody asks, ever asks, why you what's the function why are you studying basic science <laughs> this is why it's to under if you don't understand how the virus works then you will be you won't be as competent into uh developing tools with it or against it or in ever uh, which way so we are doing a lot of structural and this this understanding again of the viral host interaction and how it works uh, actually gives you an enormous amount of tools so knowing the the new the a new species how the virus interacts with that new species what are the proteins that this new species expresses or uses against the virus uh, it gives you a, a let's say, um, um, ammunition. So, for example, uh, up until the uh, recent, as I mentioned, the the mechanism by which Appleback three recognizes viral RNA was unknown. By knowing, by using our SGHIV and looking at the Appleback, uh, one of the Appleback three proteins in pigtail macaques, we were able to identify one protein that behaved very well in crystal structures and now we have the crystal structure the crystal structure in turn allowed us to figure out how the protein saw viral rna and uh I, similarly with zap it's trying to now assemble all the components figure out which proteins interact or interact with what and try and get complexes the structure of complexes to really understand the uh, mechanism and hiv in 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 those parts of the studies i think is more a tool rather than the actual uh, yes ultimately will have effects on hiv too but you can also use the virus to learn so many things so uh, yeah that's great cool uh, so the second question, I think it's uh, related to the first part of the talk. What special vaccine strategies did you have in mind uh, when you talk? Okay, so let me be very, very honest. I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, we are, uh, I'm very, um, it's very clear that our antiretroviral drugs against HIV are extremely, work extremely well. Uh, it's also clear that we have now the capacity to develop new ones, long acting ones, and even better ones than the ones we have before. For vaccine development so far against HIV-1, I personally, maybe Paul disagrees, don't see something new and something revolutionary to apply to any model, let alone a new model. Uh, I think that, um, that there's some issues with HIV-1 biology that render vaccine development against, against it extremely hard, uh, like the fact that it affects the immune system itself, like the fact that it integrates into your uh, body and it becomes part of you. But also perhaps uh, more worrying is the incredible amount of div diversity that we have existing already and being generated all the time that will render, I think, vaccine approaches difficult against it. Gotcha. So we are still going to stick with new therapeutic, new therapeutic strategies? 
that's the cure yeah. and prevention, of course. Prevention therapeutic with SDHIV, but also to try and understand uh, what is it about this CD8 manipulation that affects pathogenesis so that can tune pathogenesis so uh, precisely, because nobody knows that. You'd think that after 30 years of research, we'd understand all aspects, but we actually don't. So we are trying to figure out what part of these acute infection is controlled so um, um, is so finely controlled by CD8 cells. So really understand how the immune system interacts with the sees or controls virus replication. And that in turn potentially might have, again, uh, ap applications in intervention. Uh, Great. Ahead. We hope. <laughs> also one more question, uh, do RNA modification play a role uh, in retrovirus pathogenesis, except for C2U deamination? Sorry, sorry, say that again? No worries. Uh, do other RNA modifications play uh, a role in retrovirus pathogenesis? Is something known about that? Yes, it's, it's, it's actually a little, um, a little controversial. The, probably the best work that's been done on that is from my old mentor, um, Brian Cullen, but um, there are work, there's work from other groups as well, and it's not entirely entirely consistent but but absolutely yes as as much as a, every not every many other messenger rna molecules are subjected to covalent rna modification so is the hiv genome and it can affect things like splicing translation um even genome packaging into into virus particles um in ways that are, are, I would say, still being worked out, but but have been worked out in some detail for specific specific modifications at specific sites in the HIV genome. But but yes, just like mRNA, the life of an mRNA, the life of an HIV genome is affected by those modifications. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, one question is regarding your training. How did you manage to get where you are now? You know, working with monkeys, working with I mean, HIV, it's, it's hot. So any, I don't know, advice, your path, like I can tell that Paul got his education mostly in the UK and then he did a postdoc in California, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then he became a professor at Rockefeller. Theodora is from Greece. She got her education in uh, the UK and France and came to the US. So how, what happens <laughs> after PhD, before PhD? <laughs> Well, I, I, I can say that in my case, my career path, path was not exquisitely planned. Mm. Um, there, there are a lot of accidents, chance encounters along the way. I could easily not have even been a virologist. Um, it, it was really opportunities that came my way at, at a particular time that... Um, that I was open to. So uh, I would say, you know, let, let serendipity have its, have its role in, in determining um, your future. Um, it, honestly, curious minds and smart people can, can get interested in just about anything. That has been my experience. Um, the other thing is not necessarily don't necessarily get married to what you're working on right because you know something way more interesting can can come along tomorrow and I don't know if that sort of comes out in the in the work that we've talk, talked about today but there, there's quite a lot of um I would say diversity in 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 what we work on that's partly our personalities. Some people don't have that personality. They prefer to specialize in one area, but that's just not us. We, we like to get interested in, in, in many different things. I think that's a good thing at the early stages of your career. Once you become a faculty member, it's probably better to focus a bit more than we have. 
Um, <laughs> I wouldn't but, agree. Based on the slides, I wouldn't agree that you need to focus more. <laughs> but certainly during the early stages of your career, be open to all sorts all sorts of opportunities and, and allow yourself to be excited by things you you might be surprised that you're excited about. That's true. So That's say true. yes, there's still people that are working on mutating every single residue of the VPU transmembrane domain to figure out which tetherins interacts with. And it yeah, we could have done that too, but no, we didn't want to. So my I would say the the reason why I'm here is chance it's utter chance i i happen to to so when i finished in greece there was no biochemistry in greece no biology nothing there was you couldn't even study it as a subject i didn't even know what it was but it sounded super exciting <laughs> so wow. i was lucky again luck has a lot to do with it that it was actually political situations that the greece had just joined the eu and i could go anywhere to study and not have to pay ridiculous fees so I went I thought oh this biochemistry thing sounds cool let's go try it out so that's what I did and I ended up in England and then once I finished university realized that you doesn't really give you a sense for research I mean I don't think that you actually learn science I still don't remember the Krebs cycle he does I don't <laughs> uh and it's but it doesn't give you a sense of what it's like to work in a lab and uh, so I went, I, I found a job and I worked as a technician. I just so happened to be in an HIV lab and realized that I loved this. It was a very good lab. But most of all, I loved being in the lab and doing experiments. For me, I could just not believe that I would actually, this could be a job, uh, that, that I could actually yeah. do this for my for a, for a living, for a career. for a, And that was it. After that, I was hooked. So the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to try things out. Don't be afraid to try to take chances. So while I was working in the lab in, in London, I decided, yes, I need to get a PhD. It just so happened that it was a very international lab. There were a lot of researchers there. One of them was going to start their own lab in France. And they told me, oh, come and do a PhD with me. I didn't speak French. Okay. So I said, sure, I'll come. Why not? And I... Well, the first year I took night lessons, learned French to survive, and, and it was a fantastic experience. And then, so just don't, just particularly when you're young, just try it. You might not work out, but it's, it's a chance. Well, great. Thank you. I'm amazed by the response. Uh, yeah, one of the follow-up questions I got also was, did you find retrovirology or did it find you? But I think we got to that part. Uh, and one, one, I think this is the last question I have in chat. So someone from the audience, if they have some, can go on afterwards. Uh, what motivated you to become, you know, a policymakers in the early pandemic? And I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're policymakers. We tried. I mean, you tried, you tried, Long but time. you succeeded. I mean, this... Yes, we were again. I don't know. You never know what 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 like uh, there for SARS. It was frustration because now we have kids and and we could see this this unknown virus threat coming and nobody was doing anything. It was really that and mm -hmm. as talking about it and, and waiting for someone to do something. And when we realized that no one was going to do anything, we thought, all right, now we have to do something ourselves. That's and we have fantastic colleagues that responded straight away and supported this. And uh, that's why I managed to be uh, effective. But again, it's like, try, just try. Yeah. Sometimes try. it will work, sometimes it won't work. <laughs> just do it. I, I think that's the <laughs> bottom line. I have to say, I have to say that the pandemic has been um, eye-opening and, in some ways, concerning to me. So, you know, we I think before the pandemic, you you would think, okay, if if um, some sort of disaster, any kind of disaster, pandemic or or anything else, befalls society, that there's there's going to be somebody in government who knows what they're doing, who's going to step forward and, and handle the situation and, and direct the public in a way that, that makes sense. What became very obvious to us early in the pandemic is that person doesn't exist. 
that person yeah. wa at least wasn't here in our city. That so, person had to be you. Well, not specifically us, but we, yeah. you know, somebody has to step forward and say something, and to get to get something done. Um, and that 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 was sort of the genesis of our involvement in trying trying to influence public policy. Obviously, we're just we're just two scientists. We we don't really have decision making power, but we have voices. And but you advised, so that's what they think government needed at that point. Or it was good. I mean, we were lucky with the with the um, response. But again, it has so happened that there was one a couple of politicians that really paid attention. And lots of them That's didn't, cool. but they. So it's just you never you never know who who might listen and who might not. But uh, yeah. I can't say that we. Um, this is what we want to do, like affect public policy in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> I wish yeah. they would listen a little bit more, but. but yeah, you're going to stay in the lab. <laughs> But but as as virologists, you know, you spend you spend your life training to learn about viruses. When when and when a pandemic comes along, you know, you can't really just look around for someone else to to step up. Yeah. It's, it's, it's your you. time. This is what yeah. you practiced for, right? Yeah. And and this is this is what I say. Say it has been again though because of what we managed to to accomplish. So for me, SARS-CoV-2 must have been what the virologists were like in the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. So it's a brand new virus, a brand new field. And yes, lockdowns were horrible. Uh, social um, isolation was really hard. Everyday life was very hard. But the science, the science has been just... I think what has kept us going at least during this time it's incredible and you're right there in the middle of it with all this new information and you're discovering things every every day is just a new look what we found now and this is and is just um, amazing it's it, it's really uh, uh it, it has been quite a ride i would say Great. Speaking of the pandemic, someone asked, how did you find the transition between, you know, retrovirus from retroviruses to coronavirus? Like they're quite a distinct term. The, obviously, there's a learning curve. You have to learn your way around the, the viral genome and protein. But the principles are very much the same. Um, we, we specifically adapted techniques that, with which we were familiar to apply them to SARS-CoV-2 research. That's not, not to say we became experts in coronaviruses overnight or even now, um, but there are certain aspects of virus biology that are pretty, where the techniques and thought process are pretty portable between viruses. So. So neutralizing antibodies, for example, that they, they work in more or less the same way, um, irrespective of what virus is being targeted. And, and that, that's something that essentially any virologist um, who has a particular set of techniques under their belt can work on. And that's what we did. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the uh, people that the, a lot of the labs that developed neutralizing assays were HIV labs. Because we do huh? this, we do this yes. for HIV. We've been doing this for HIV. We have, we know how to do it. So we, we could develop the. This was another another thing that helped at least our transition. We didn't want, of course, if we jumped in and looked at, I don't know, RNA replication of the coronavirus, we would have no idea what to do because that's not something that we do. But pseudotypes, ah, uh, pseudotypes, we can do very very well and the neutralization assay. So we we started with what we knew what how to do and slowly have, um, I, I said, expanded our repertoire and involvement with the other aspects of the virus. Uh, That's great. Thank you. And I have one more in the chat. What source would you recommend for someone who is interested in immunology, like educational source, book, or? Principles of virology. <laughs> <laughs> no, immunology, not, not the virology. <laughs> well, the, the second volume has quite a lot of immunology in it so gotcha. from a virus point of view. No, um, I mean, the classic textbook is Jane away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so to, to, just to be clear, we are not immunologists, so we, we might not be the best 
um, people to advise on that. Um, but but yes, um, January I think is good. Um, just I would take a sort of basic immunology course at, at university. The, the fundamentals um, have been in place for quite a while now. It's it's really once you get into the the um, the the details, uh, it it becomes it becomes. Um, it's really too large a field for one person to absorb. If if you if you talk to someone who's an immunologist, that they, they would have a very sort of narrow yeah. focus within immunology. Um, so so it, it's difficult to say one thing covers any any everything. But I think that January book is the widely regarded as the the best comprehensive text. Yes, Thank you. I think Theodora. What you I said think that, is true. So but no, I, just, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you would say that finding an internship in an immunology lab would be more beneficial than taking courses. I mean, yeah, at some point you have to learn some basics, but yes, yeah. trying to, uh, trying it out because the the there the techniques are quite quite different and the uh, the expertise is is quite different. But again, you can learn anything really and uh it's uh, great yeah. do we have any more questions from the audience yes please i wanted to follow up so first of all uh hello guys and thanks for this lecture it was very nice i especially love theodora's uh, life pathway of deciding <laughs> to study french i'm i'm amazed uh because i've also been studying french for years now so I was interested in this epigenetic aspect that we've been mentioning. Uh, why is it so controversial? And this, I guess that's because there's not much data on that. And these initial um, information that we have, what does it suggest? Mm -hmm. Are there any specific patterns that are going towards somewhere um, as indicating as a pathogenic factor or everything's just still cloudy? Thank so you. if you're talking, to, referring to the, the epitranscriptomic um, data. I guess the, the, the field got off to a bad start with um, basically two or three groups looking at the role of M6A in HIV replication and coming to diametrically opposed conclusions. Um, I think still to this day, it's it's unclear why that's true. And I don't think I, any of the groups involved have sort of backed down on their positions. Um, so it, that's very hard hard to, to reconcile and has sort of, I wouldn't say poisoned the field, but um, has, has, made, has made it more difficult, I think. Um, I, I obviously have my own biases based on my former mentor being a protagonist in in this field, um, but and and it is it isn't a field that I follow uh, particularly closely. But but there are if you just just you know look up the papers, you you'll find um, sort of fairly clear phenotypes associated with um, with at least some of the RNA modifications. Um, the real challenge, I think, in in that entire field, though, is while it, it's 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 very easy to find um, that a particular nucleotide is modified on a particular RNA. Measuring how much of the total RNA pool has that modification is is significantly more challenging, uh, and I think in those cases um, it, it's it's difficult to know whether a particular modification has a direct effect or an indirect effect. Um, um, just, just the you know the tools for manipulation are 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 a bit restricting. Right. Thank you. I do think that there is something in it. So probably some technological advances are still in need for us to be able to get some more informative results. Yes, I mean, so so here, here, here's a conceptual problem. Okay, you find that a, a particular position in the um, HIV genome is modified, M6A, whatever. How do you show that that 
particular modification on that particular nucleotide is, is important for virus replication. I mean, if you knock out the enzymes that are responsible for that modification, you, you obviously have pleiotropic effects on the cell. Um, and if you modify the, that nucleotide in the HIV genome, well, is it really just the, the methyl group on the adenine or the fact that you changed it to a G that, that's causing, that causes the perturbation? Those are the, so I mean, these are very simple conceptual problems, but th those are the, the sorts of problems that, that, um, um, uh, that the field is, is grappling with. Yes, I see. Very interesting. Thank you. I don't think we have any further questions. If we do, someone can stop me. I would like to thank Theodore and Paul. Thank you very much for this amazing talk. Uh, oh, Katrina has one. Sorry, go. Uh, yes, uh, greetings. It was very uh, nice lecture and thank you for all the details. I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you personally think that academic circles are becoming more and more closed to sharing the knowledge? For example, if you have a trial, you se sequenced a part of gene and your base calling is not looking right, and you have to ask for help. Do you think that people would help you? I missed a, a critical word there. If you repeat the, the last sentence again about base calling. Uh, let's say if you are researching, if you're in research uh, for, I don't know, molecular diagnostics, and uh -huh. you have found, uh, um, you're suspecting a mutation, but you're not sure and you want to ask someone for help, like someone that's into that specific region or gene, and then do you think that people would help? Um, I, so my experience is, has generally been that people are very helpful. The, the obstacles, I think, to getting help for particular problems generally aren't, aren't people, um, being secretive or uh, unwilling to help. It's, it's um, I think people just being busy, right? So the, the number of times I have people contact me who, who want to talk about a scientific problem, um, I'd love to help everybody, but, but sometimes, you know, you have to prioritize your own work over other people's. So I, in general, I think people are open and willing to help. It's just finding finding the right person with the right expertise who can easily answer your question without having to devote a week's work to it. I think that that's really the 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 issues with science at the moment. It's just the volume of work rather than the the rather than any lack of willingness to to collaborate and help. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any further questions? Okay, now this is a try to, to wrap things up. Thank you very much, Paul and Theodora. Uh, this was an inspiring lecture. I really liked the discussion uh, at the very end. And have, uh, have nice holidays. Stay safe, take care, and let's stay in touch. Thank you, everyone, for Thank coming. Thank you very much. And congratulations. This